I'm very, really, really pleased to have Sylvia Buck tonight, who is the library director of the town of Warren and chairman of their historical commission. Um, she's here to talk about Lucy Stone, who I have kind of dubbed our most famous local daughter, or one of them, but she's the most important woman in American history. Um, and I bet Mrs. Buck would agree with that. I think so. And I will let Mrs. Buck tell us a little bit more about herself if now, she likes. You're going to stay put so you'll learn about Lucy Stone. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> All right? So you may Very begin. Good. Very good. Well, Lucy Stone was one of the best known women leaders, and she was very ahead of her time. She was born in 1818 in West Brookfield, uh, the eighth of nine children, not all of whom survived. And when she was born, her mother lamented, Oh dear, not another girl. Her life will be so hard. Of course, Lucy didn't hear that or remember that, but she saw it for her own eyes as she grew up and watched the mother, her, her mother's life of drudgery. And she began learning at her mother's side the lessons that she would come to live by for the rest of her life. She became, much to her surprise, a mother herself. For, I say surprise, because she had no intentions of getting married. She had seen what it was like between men and women in married relationships in those days. So many of them believed in the man having the rule of the household and the women having to obey. So. She often got into arguments with her dad about it. And he insisted that it is so that this is show how it shall be. It says so right here in the Bible. And Lucy looked over and she said to herself, Well, I don't know how it got in there like that. I'm going to see about the original texts. I'm going to go to school and learn Hebrew and Latin as the women in, as the men in those days did who became uh, preachers they learned original languages and studied the bible in that way but she had a long way to go before she got to that point she was perhaps a bit of a rebellious girl as you might have guessed since she was speaking talking back to her father and um, it, perhaps she got those that rebellious genes from her grandfather, who was in and participated in Shay's Rebellion. Do you remember your history? Yes. Well, uh, she was not about to keep quiet when she thought something was not right. But she wasn't a strident person. In fact, when she began speaking publicly, they said she had such charm and such charisma and such a way of speaking that she would beguile your audience and you would go away smiling, even though you might have disagreed with what she said. Well, she decided she had to go to school, as I said, in those days. You had to go to school locally first. And when you got through the elementary school, then what were you going to do? She went to Munson, Munson Academy, and Wilbraham Academy for a very short time. But then her sister died, and she had to come home. Her sister, when she di her sister died, Lucy was only 20. And um, she went to her sister's grave, and she stood there, and she read the stone that said, Elizabeth wife of Ira Barlow, March 7th, 1838. And she thought to herself, all that is left of a married woman is that she was the wife of somebody. And she certainly didn't see that as a good legacy of her sister. She formed unconventional opinions about marriage outside of her household too because 
she observed the neighbors and their friends, their family friends. One of the neighbors down the road a ways was Lucy Lamberton, whose husband was not a very good provider or a kind person. Well, Lucy was very much pregnant and nearing the last of her days, and finally her father came over to visit her and he said, won't you come home to mom and my house for a little while until the baby's born? And Lucy Lamberton said, okay. And she climbed aboard her father's wagon and they went over to his house. But she no sooner got there. But what her husband heard about it. And he came barreling up the driveway and he stormed into the house and he said, Lucy, you come home with me. And pregnant or not, about to give birth or not, he dragged her home because she was his possession. And that's the way that men often thought about their wives in those days. So you can see that our rebellious little young girl was not about to do that, not about to agree to any kind of an arrangement like that. Uh, so she had to figure out how to go to school beyond the elementary school. And um, it cost money. There were no free high schools. Well, she asked her father to pay, and he said, Oh, no, why would I pay for you? You don't need to go to school further. Why do you need to go to school? He had paid for her brothers, one of whom became a minister. But he wasn't going to pay for her, and so she decided, like the little red hen, I'll do it myself. She went out in the woods, and she gathered berries and nuts, and she sold them around the neighborhood. Makes me think of the days that I made cookies and sold them around the neighborhood to all my mother's poor friends having to buy my cookies. <laughs> but she used that money to pay for her tuition. And one of the first, I mentioned she went to Munson and to Wilbraham, and then uh, she went to Quaybog Seminary in Warren when it first opened in 1842. And we have at the library one of the catalogs, that very first catalog that lists all the people. Well, one day I got to thinking about that, and I thought, I wonder how many girls and how many boys there were, <coughs> knowing that certain things weren't equal and even. But I was ha happily surprised that there were 56 boys and 55 girls wow. in that first group. Wow. So they almost made it even. Yeah. Well, she was a member of the church in West Brookfield. And... Uh, there had come a time when Deacon Henshaw, the clergyman over there, was brought to trial for allowing at his pulpit Abby Kelly, who became Abby Kelly Foster, to speak about abolition. Terrible thing? Well, it was a time when the Congregational Church was beginning to shift over. Heretofore, it had supported and in my town, we have the record where it had supported those who agreed with abolishing slavery. But then there was a tipping point, and they decided to censure um, Deacon Henshaw. Well, the, the, the uh, congregation gathered together to put it to a vote. And when the minister asked for those who approved, hands went up, and when the minister asked for those who disapproved, other hands went up, and Lucy's was among them. And he said, Lucy, you are not voting. Put your hand down. And she said, but I'm a member. And he said, I'd like to have everybody vote now, disregarding her. Okay, everybody in your favor, put up your hands. Everybody opposed, put up your hands. And again, she put up her hand. Six times she put up her hand when he called for a vote. And six times he refused to allow her to vote, even though she was a member in the West Brookfield Congregational Church. Well, she decided, as I said, that she wanted to keep going on. And so when she got out of, she was, uh, she was 25 uh, when she was 
able to scramble together the tuition to go to college. But where to go? There weren't many colleges. There weren't hardly any colleges that allowed women in those days. There was one out in Ohio, Oberlin. Still is there, still celebrated. Five-year program, studies versus uh, uh, study period and then work period. And uh, so she gathered together enough money for her first tuition. Her father didn't contribute, but her brother did. And she uh, did all her sewing with a friend in Warren of her clothing, because of course in those days, in the 1850s, you didn't just go down to the store and buy ready-made clothing. If you wanted it, you bought the cloth and you took it home and you sewed it. So her friend helped her sew it, and off she went by, by the cheapest method of traveling. And when she got there, she couldn't afford board, so she had to cook for herself. And she sometimes uh, tutored other students, or she did housework. All the kinds of normal things that young people might do today to raise enough money to pay for their education. While well, she was there, one time she went to a lecture by Abby Kelly Foster. So they were intertwined. And uh, she didn't agree with all of Abby's uh, <coughs> anti-establishment thoughts, but some of them resonated. And one in particular, the marriage laws, they agreed heartily on. For the marriage laws said that once you women married, whatever you had owned up to now was no longer yours. Whatever you owned from now forward was no longer yours. There's a great um, uh, women's history exhibit out in Seneca Falls. And one of the exhibits speaks about a lawsuit that a woman brought against her husband for non-support. While he was not supporting her, she went out and got a job, and she supported herself. And so he rebutted in court, in the suit, that indeed he had supported her with her money that she earned. For it was his, you see and he would allow her to use it. It was not a good thing in Lucy's view. By the time she graduated, she was the valedictorian of her class. Now that's quite an honor when you get to be a valedictorian. And of course, most of the time, valedictorians give a valedictory speech. And she wrote one but she was not allowed to deliver it. And so she took it home, unspoken. For she felt that nobody else was going to give her speech. When she came home, it was the first time she'd been home in four or five years to visit her mother. And she was so glad because they had been very close. And after the first few days had gone by, her mother said, Well, Lucy, now what are you going to do? And she said, Well, Mother, I've decided I want to go on the speaking circuit. Well, her mother was pretty horrified. <laughs> women didn't do that. Nice women didn't. You don't get up on stage if you're a nice lady. And she argued and argued with Lucy. Oh, please, please, do not do such a thing. Lucy said, no, no, I have some things I want to say, and I want to do this very much. And finally, the mother said, well, if you must, could you please go far away where nobody knows us and won't embarrass us? But of course she didn't. In fact, her first public speak, speech was up in Gardner from her brother's pulpit. There she got him captive audience and she got to say a few words. Well, who do you get who do you go to for a job when you want to make a living as a public speaker in a day when women didn't do public speaking? She went to the Abolition Society in Massachusetts, headquartered in Worcester. And they hired her. 
and she was a very good draw. They got lots of people to come to their talks, her talks. One time, one of the, her, her bosses, you might say, one of the abolitionists who had hired her, was um, uh, visiting um, in the audience. And after the talk, he said, you know, Lucy, we hired you to talk about abolition. And we noticed that you've been speaking about women's rights. <laughs> and the law, and marriage, and all that stuff. Now, that's not fair. She said, yes, I agree, that's not, that's not right. So here's what I'll do. I will speak for you on the weekends, and I will speak for me in the weeks. And so she did. She went to ta town, she made her own posters, she tacked them up on the tree wherever she was going to speak, to notify people, since of course there was no telephone, telegraph, television, radio, and the crowds would come. Of course they were horrified to come. They didn't agree with her at all, but they came. And she figured out that they would come in spite of disagreeing with her, and she began to charge them for it. And still they would come and they would pay to get in. It wasn't much. It was maybe 25 cents, as that was done in those days. She began to make a lot of money in a day when you wouldn't think you could make a nickel as a public speaker and a woman on stage. It was, however, a little dangerous because people often came with rotten eggs and rotten tomatoes and they'd throw them and they'd boo and they'd hiss and they'd make a lot of racket. Not like you folks. Nice, quiet audience. And sometimes they got really rowdy. One time she was on stage with some other abolitionists, and one of them said to her, you know, Lucy, we better hit the back door before this crowd really loses it and we get hurt. And she said, no, I don't think so. And she came down off the stage right beside this big burly guy that's jumping up and down and yelling and screaming and making a lot of noise. And she put her arm through his, and she said, young man, will you accompany us out the door? And he looked at her, much amazed, and then he puffed right up, and he marched her right down the aisle, out, the, out to the yard, and there was a um, tree stump. And he put his big hands around her little waist, and he lifted her up and plucked her on the tree stump, and he said, now, Miss Lucy, will you talk to us some more? Aww. That was the way she had with crowds and with individuals. There were other women, and there have been many women over the years, who have been accused of speaking more, less charmingly, <clears throat> but not our Lucy. I mentioned that she was not planning to marry. In fact, she was adamant about it. Not for me, thank you very much, as long as those laws are as they are. And one of the reasons that she really felt so strongly had occurred when she was uh, living over at her brother Bowman Stone's house with his wife on Ragged Hill in West Brookfield. Just a mile and a half down the road lived the Adams family. And Bowman Stone's wife had a brother named Charlie Robinson. He was just beginning to set up a physician's practice in Springfield. And he'd incurred a few debts, but was, never mind that, you know. He had begun to court Sarah Adams, a mile and a half down the road from Bowman's house. And he came often enough that she said finally yes, and they would be married. So of course the marriage, as in those days, took place at the Adams household. It was pretty generally known that Mr. Adams was a comfortable man and that his gift to his daughter for the wedding was going to be a substantial bit of money. So the wedding took place and the ceremony was concluded and the guests and the family were all milling around and suddenly there came a knock at the door. Well, Mr. Adams went to the door to answer it and there stood the sheriff. What do you want? 
I want to collect Mr. Charlie Robinson's debts. I know that now that he is married, he has come into some money. Well, Mr. Adams was pretty horrified, and he quietly settled the matter himself and sent the sheriff on his way, but not before Lucy Stone was practically beside herself. And she said these laws must be changed. But she again said, I will never marry. Well, when they were on the lecture circuit, of course, she met other abolitionist speakers, and one of them was Harry Blackwell. He was, uh, let me see, he was a ex-hardware store merchant that had, that business had kind of gone sour, and then he got into land speculation, and he wasn't very good at that. But never mind that, he was good and interesting person, and they shared letters. They wrote back and forth to each other over many, many months, and as a matter of fact, over, I think, nine years. They really did have a meeting of the minds about women's rights, about the rights of people in those days, and about um, abolition. Well, of course, the longer they wrote, and occasionally met, the more you began to hear Harry say, what about it, Lucy? Don't you think we ought to marry? And she would say, sorry, no deal. And he'd say, yet again, what about it, Lucy? And she'd say, you're a nice man, Harry, but get lost. <laughs> and this went on and on and on for over nine years. And finally, she said, well, maybe. And here's the deal. What you might call a prenup agreement. Whatever is mine is mine. Whatever I earn, whatever I own, whatever I ever have is mine. And so shall it be for you. And we will together, as partners, support this marriage. And they both agreed. They called this the protest against the marriage laws of that day and um, against the legal prejudice against married women. For you know that even as a married woman, if your husband should have died, you would have had to petition the court for permission to raise your own children. Incompetent woman that they thought you were. Well, this protest got a lot of publicity, let me tell you. And uh, Lucy and Harry began to, in their travels, speak about it. And they traveled to Vermont in 1870. And in fact, in several western states, when travel in western states was quite a bit harder than it is today. Let's see, in 1867 they were in Kansas, in Michigan in 1874. <laughs> in Colorado three years after that, and in Nebraska in 1892 to advocate for their new prenuptial agreement. And Kansas voted it in in 1867. Wyoming Territory passed new laws in 1869. Utah in 1870. And Washington State in 1883. And by the way, when she married, she kept her own name. But you knew that, didn't you? <clears throat> she said, I am Lucy Stone, and you are Harry Blackwell. And you are my husband, and I love you dearly, but I am still Lucy Stone. One time, Mr. Adams, <laughs> whose daughter married Charlie Robinson, who had the debts, uh, Mr. Adams uh, met Lucy Stone on the train one morning. And he said, why, good morning, Mrs. Blackwell. <laughs> she looked at him coldly and said, Lucy <coughs> Stone, Lucy Stone, if you please. This story has been passed down in the family, the Adams family, and was written out by two, three generations later for us to, to save and to be able to share and to pass along.
because you are all going to pass along this message. Well, let me see. What did she do besides talk it up? She did marry, as I said, and she did have a child, have a child Alice. And uh, Lucy founded and was the first president of the New England Women's Suffrage Association. In Warren, she came to speak at one of those meetings in 1892. So she was back in the same place she'd started before she went off to college. She and her husband founded the Boston Women's Journal, a newspaper in 1870 that they edited and um, uh, included articles about women's rights and abolition from 1870. It was uh, a going, lively newspaper for 22 years. And of course, this was in the time when women weren't even supposed to put their names on anything they've written publicly. But by the way, there was an author over in Brookfield that was the Danielle Steele of her time. And so some women were already beginning to break those rules. She, that author, wrote 65 very popular books, as I said, like the Daniel Steele of today. And Lucy Stone wrote article after article and got that paper out time after time. They published it in a building just across from the State House. There's another building there now, but the building that they were in, I always like to think that she was keeping an eye on those legislators to see if she could get them convinced to pass new laws. Well, she participated in the first National Women's Rights Convention. You might think that that was the one in Seneca Falls, but that was not a national one in Seneca Falls. It was a local, it was a regional, and a very important start to a women's rights convention. But the first national convention, which included people uh, um, and speakers from um, Cleveland, Ohio, and New York, and New Jersey, and Michigan, I think, <coughs> included Lucy Stone, and she put out the call and was the first one to sign for the call to have come to this convention. Uh, by 1869, she was in Cleveland herself, participating with delegates from 21 states. Well, there came a time when the end of her life was approaching. And, um, and she kind of knew it. And she spoke to her daughter. And she said, you must labor unceasingly until every woman will possess equal and full justice in all things. This is on a sign on Route 9 over in West Brookfield right near the little side road that you can drive up to see her home site. The home is no longer standing, but it used to look like this. It included a dairy barn and a milking parlor. It was burned down in 1950 by owners who weren't of the family and weren't careful of the per important home site. But it's now the, um, the uh, grounds are now owned by um, uh, hmm, I hope I can say this. Uh, um, not, not the land trust, but trustees of reservation, uh, which also owns the Rock House Reservation just down the road and many other uh, parcels and uh, historic spots in Massachusetts. <clears throat> this is a, one of her famous, most famous pictures, but I like this younger view too. And perhaps you'll step up and look at those when you have a chance later on. Uh, when, she, when she was in her later years, she curtailed her travel somewhat, but she didn't get her isolated from the rest of the world. Everyone came to her who was anybody, and she entertained the high and the low on her front porch, serving them lemonade. When Lucy Stone died in 1893, the major city newspapers ran banner headlines as big as you have seen that announced war 
They said, Stone is dead. It was that important a, a milestone. And uh, she also, in death, was among those early uh, pioneers. She had her remains cremated, and they're in the columbarium in Forest Hill Cemetery, Jamaica Plains. Well, you may have wondered what these other portraits were about if you didn't come up here yet. Um, Lucy Stone's uh, legacy has been passed along, but sometimes not given uh, recognition to Lucy Stone. Uh, for there were other women, of course, who um, sponsored and spoke at great length and tirelessly for the women's rights movement. And they came to a parting of the ways one day over the issue of who should get the vote first, women or black men. Now, if you had to vote, how would you have voted? How many would have voted for black men? For you know she had been a speaker for abolition and for equal rights for black people. You know how strongly she felt about that. Would you have supported her in that? Or would you have supported those who said, no, it should be the women. Forget those black men. Well, maybe the t color of our skin makes us think these things differently. But Lucy felt, having supported the abolitionist cause these many years, that the black men should have the vote, followed soon afterwards, of course, by all women. And that's where she came to a parting of the ways with the other women who were leading those causes. <clears throat> and so when they came to write, the definitive history of the women's rights movement, she was barely mentioned. And that's why we have to keep talking about Lucy Stone so that we'll pass the word on and share the fact that she was probably one of the first of the abolition of the uh, suffragist movement. Um, one of the ways we honor women and men is by portraits in important places. And uh, former Senator Brewer, uh, former Senator, um, who did I say the other Wetmore. day? Wetmore. Thank you, Wetmore. Uh, began to notice that as he walked up and down the State House, all these great portraits of men, and not a woman among, a woman among them. And he formed a committee to remedy that. Well, by mistake, somehow, I got on that committee. <laughs> I say by mistake because I certainly wasn't qualified, but I was delighted to be able to sit in on it and sit in the Senate chamber on the big oval table and look down over the city and listen to those who were qualified, the academics and so on, discuss which women shall we honor. Of course, I wanted to say, there's only one woman that we need to, but of course there were many, many, many qualified names, and they got it down to 25 names, and still that was too many. So they thought, for the very first, well, sh how shall we do this? Shall we have all 25 in a big crowd, where again women are kind of lost in the, in the commotion? Or shall we reduce the numbers to individual faces that you can see and recognize for this time around, and next time we will add more. And that's what was finally decided. They chose six, and Lucy Stone was among them. So you must go to the State House and stand beside and have your picture taken beside Lucy Stone's bas relief here and celebrate her life. On the background of the um, exhibit. These are black marble, I believe. And on the background, all this um, gray matter are quotations that each of the women made in their speeches. 
various times. Uh, you can get a, a, a brochure like this. I, sorry, I didn't bring enough to hand out of these. Uh, but uh, you can get these from the State House if you ask your um, senator or representative. Or you can get a bunch for your crowd, um, which I have done in the past. Because that way we get to spread the word about the good work that Lucy Stone and many others did. There was another way that she was recognized not long afterwards. Someone was sitting around in the mechanics hall and looking around at all those lovely men's portraits and said, what's going on here? Or what is it going on? Yeah, right. That's what what is it? <laughs> of course, in the beginning, in the early days, mechanics referred to not just mechanical, but, but industrial workers and so on. And so perhaps it was appropriate that they were focusing on them, but it was time that women were added. So four women were added to that exhibit. Clara Barton, uh, Dorothea Dix, Lucy Stone, and I always forget who the fourth one was. But next time you go to an event there, you cast your eyes around and you'll see our friends. Abby Kelly Foster, thank you very much. Yes. So now we get to celebrate them and they are not lost to history after all. And um, there are other ways that they have been celebrated. There was a postage stamp uh, for Lucy Stone one year. And uh, among the uh, prominent Americans honored in that series were President Kennedy, General Marshall, Albert Einstein, Frank Lloyd Wright. She kept good company, didn't she? <laughs> And then, of course, we've erected signs in West Brookfield, both near her, uh, her home site and um, uh, around in the out, outer edges of the town, uh, directing you to go to the home site. The Trustees of Reservation is not planning to develop that home site in any great dramatic way. But uh, when they get around to it and have enough funds, they hope to have some quiet trails that you can walk around and do quiet contemplation. There'll be a sign or two here and there, uh, maybe a quotation um, to remind you of what Lucy Stone felt. And I think it's just neat to be able to stand in that very spot and think about her, thinking about the neighbors down the road and forming her opinions of how things should be and not how they are or were. March 8th has been set aside in Massachusetts as uh, Lucy Stone Day. So we must remember that each year. And um, if you get to Boston Public Library, you will see a large mural with a number of women in it. And sure enough, there's Lucy Stone. And if you go down the library reading room, and you tiptoe and try not to make so much noise as we did in our group, you can see her bust on a mantelpiece. So she's spread around, but it's going to be still requiring the help of you to say, but folks, did you hear about Lucy Stone? And if they don't know, you're going to tell their story. And I hope you've enjoyed listening to the story. And thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much.